Hello, and welcome to the AAMFT Podcast, your all-access pass to the latest news developments and thought leaders in the world of systemic therapy. We strive to relate, educate, and innovate one episode at a time. I'm your host, Dr. Eli Karam, and we're brought to you by the American Association for Marriage and Family Therapy. Our podcast explores topics that relationship-based therapists care about. In addition to featuring unique conversations and interviews with established experts, our show provides information and education on direct practice and emerging trends in the MFT profession. For more information, please visit us at aamft.org. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show. Eli, back with you on the AAMFT podcast. And certainly we have a big show in store for you today. When I think back of when we started this podcast, I said make a list of people you could talk to. And this couple clearly, not only at the top of my list, but at the top of pretty much anybody's list that knows the field. And when we play name association with the general public and you think of couples therapy or the science of long-term committed relationships, you only think of one name and that name is Gottman. And you can't have a show with John Gottman without having a show with Julie Gottman. So my request was to have them both, and it was so granted. So I have been looking forward to this show for a long time, and through 40 years, they have done so much work. And I wanted this interview to be special, as we do on the Pioneer Series, where we go behind the model and the model developer. Very personal and professional collaboration with John and Julie. And you will get that today, including the origin of the Gottman method, how they refine their approach, and what keeps them still vital, both personally as a couple and professionally as the Gottman Institute. Most of our listeners out here will already know about John and Julie. For the sake of you that don't, here's just a little information before we get to the interview. John Gottman has conducted 40 years of breakthrough research with thousands of couples. His work not only on marriage, but also on parenting has earned him numerous major awards, including four national NIMH Research Scientist Awards. He's the AMFT Distinguished Research Scientist, American Family Therapy Academy, that's AFTA, Award for Most Distinguished Contributor to Family Systems Research, the American Psychological Association, Division of Family Psychology, Presidential Citation for Outstanding Lifetime Research, and NCFR, that's the National Council of Family Relations, Burgess Award for Outstanding Career in Theory and Research. Co-authored over 200 published academic articles and more than 40 books, including the ones you've probably read or given to your clients. The Seven Principles for Making Marriage Work, The New Eight Dates, Essential Conversations for a Lifetime of Love, which we'll talk about today, The Relationship Cure, and the one that really started it all out for me, 20 years ago in my beginning of my career, Why Marriages Succeed or Fail. Then we have Dr. Julie Schwartz Gottman, who is the co-founder and president of the Gottman Institute, also co-founder of Effective Software with her husband, John. In her own right, John will give her all of the credit today, but she is an amazing clinician, a clinical psychologist by trade, is highly respected, and is sought after internationally by media and organizations as an expert advisor on marriage. Content areas like sexual harassment, domestic violence, gay and lesbian adoption, same-sex marriage, and parenting issues. She co-authored Eight Dates and Ten Principles for Doing Effective Couples Therapy and the Marriage Clinic Casebook. So happy to be joined on the AAMFT podcast today by uh, two luminaries in the field, John and Julie Gottman. It's the most requested guest we've had, especially for this Pioneer series, and we're lucky to have both of them here. So welcome to the podcast, John and Julie. Thank you so much, Eli. It's yeah. a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Eli. I guess where I'd like to start, because people are listening are familiar in many times with your work and the Gottman method, but the origin story in this case of John and Julie. So I wonder if you guys could start, and I don't know the story. Tell me how you met and how your uh, personal connection then turned into a professional one. Well, I'll begin. So let's see, this was about 33 years ago. I had moved to Seattle after completing my PhD 
About six months earlier, John had moved from the University of Illinois to University of Washington about three months earlier, and John had been dating religiously. He had been seeing about mm, 60 women or so in three months. He made it his job, full-time job. That sounds like a research study, John. <laughs> oh, there are some great stories that come out of that, which we will not will not many excite di- you about. Many disastrous dates. Yes. Oh, my God. But um, I got a database. <laughs> right. And I did, too. I was dating a fair amount. So one day I was walking into a coffee shop. John was there. Of course, we're in Seattle, so it had to be coffee, right? And he was sitting there, and he looked really, really cool. He looked very bohemian. He had dark glasses on. He had on his black leather hat, his black coat. You know, he looked like a really cool intellectual Jewish Eastern intellectual, which was like my ideal. And he asked me for coffee, amazingly enough. So I said, sure knowing I had to go to a party in about 45 minutes. So, you know, what did I have to lose? And we ended up having a fabulous conversation, exchanged phone numbers. We walked out of that coffee shop. John walked me past his car, and his car had been voted the ugliest car by all of faculty of University of Washington in the parking lot. And I fell in love with his car. And what kind of car I- was it? <laughs> well, it was just a Dodge Dart, but it had come from Illinois, so it was full of rust, and Julie named it Bondo because it had Bondo all over it, holding it together. <laughs> it had white patches of Bondo all over this maroon uh, paint job that was scratched up and everything, so it was just wondrous. It was like a pinto horse, really. It was really magnificent. It was a heap. <laughs> it was. It was fabulous. <laughs> anyway, um, and our steps matched perfectly as we walked down the sidewalk without any effort. We both noticed that. It was mm-hmm. very cool. Yeah. And we exchanged phone numbers and then called, and our first phone call was four hours long. Oh, my um, goodness. From mm-hmm. light to dark. We couldn't believe the sun had set. Was it just uh-huh. random? You were both psychologists? You had no way of knowing that when you saw yeah. each other correct. at the coffee shop? That's correct. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And I was fascinated by John's research, and he was fascinated by my clinical work. I had specialized in working with very, very seriously traumatized clients. And he proposed five months later, and we married six months after that. Uh, wow, that was a whirlwind was courtship. Great. <laughs> I know. It was very quick. Yeah. yeah. It, was, it was. Now, yeah, at this point in know, our timeline, so we're in, the, we're in the mid-80s here. It's, it's interesting, yeah, right. John, because you started your career. Maybe you could talk a little bit about just the origin of even wanting to study couples. Because as you started, you know, we think of the mid-70s where death re- or divorce replaces death is the most common entry to a marriage and people interested in figuring out what's going on, why are all these people getting divorced, but we could talk about your initial interest in, you know, before you ever thought about couples therapy, just studying relationships. Yeah, I really went from one disastrous relationship with a woman to another, so I was hardly an expert, and just the opposite, really, you know, and and when I started collaborating with my friend, my best friend Bob Levinson at Indiana University, both of us had gone from one disastrous relationship with a woman to another one. We started doing this research together, and I know for me, what was what really kept me in academia, because I, I, I didn't really like being an academic. It, it's not a very friendly kind of place, and you know, very competitive, very cutthroat. I thought maybe I could find a different occupation, but the data really kept me in doing research our ability to predict the future of a relationship. With very different samples, the observational data we were getting differed only in the second decimal place. Things were replicating so perfectly that I thought it'd be really a crime to stop doing research here. So I stayed in the academic world, even though it wasn't really my favorite place to work. You know, at that time, people were studying to 
relationships generally at discrete points in time. One of the things um, really groundbreaking about your work is the longitudinal studies of couples and also the way you measured couples. And again, people listening to this podcast uh, have probably have elementary knowledge of the Love Lab and how you started that. But what, what was the idea to how did you your methodology to not only what you measured, but how you measured over time? Where did that come? Yeah, Bob and I were really interested, Bob Levinson and I were really interested in emotion. We were looking at how people responded to one another emotionally. We were videotaping people and also uh, measuring what was going on physiologically in their bodies, how fast their blood was flowing, how fast their hearts were beating, how much they were sweating and moving around and the respiratory system. Bob has also looked at the uh, gastrointestinal system lately as well. You know, we kept looking at, at physiology synchronized to the video time code and also showed people their videotapes and they turned a dial to let us know how they were feeling from very negative to very positive. And later developed in my lab questionnaires and interview methods to get at their internal way of thinking about emotion and their relationship and their partner's character. So kind of a multi-method approach. And we were kind of hoping that we would find differences between what we later called the masters of relationship and the disasters of relationships. You know, and by and large, we really did find differences. And we spent a dozen years looking at gay and lesbian committed couples. And I was interested in children. I've been trained as a child psychologist. So I wanted to see how did kids affect relationships and relationships affect kids? How did parent-child interaction affect uh, the whole family structure? You know, I got to study with Julie 130 newlywed couples at the University of Washington in our apartment lab where we just had couples hang out for 24 hours and roll the cameras. You know, basic observational research that, uh, and as you mentioned, longitudinal research. So, you know, a lot of these newlywed couples got pregnant and had babies. You know, we learned how to study babies and parent-baby interaction So it was a lot of fun. We got to see 222 babies in a series of studies that we did on the transition to parenthood. So all of it was based on not our intuition, but just seeing what was different about relationships that worked and relationships that didn't work, left people miserable or ended up in in divorce or relationship breakup. Yeah, you speak of the Love Lab. Uh, Julie, tell us your earliest memories professionally uh, collaborating with your husband. What was that like? Can I say something before you begin? (laughs) (laughs) I want to say that, you know, one of the things that people really don't understand about our collaboration is that Julie, from the beginning, and we've been married about 10 years before we started working together, the whole thing was her idea. And the collaboration has been, you know, so much a part, complete partnership. All the ideas that we created, all the concepts were, you know, completely Julie's as well as mine. She has been an equal partner, more than an equal partner, because I wasn't trained as a therapist. She was. She had you know, a huge amount of experience. So her intuitions, her ideas really were prominent in all of this. And that's an important thing for me to say, I think. Yeah, I'm, I'm, so, I'm so glad you mentioned that because, and that's why I said, you can't interview one without the other because I view you all as a team in both ways. And I was watching an early interview with you. I can't remember who it was. It was a national outlet, John, where you said, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm a marital researcher and, and my wife is the one that really helps me shape, you know, transform this research in, into action. So, yeah, I mean, I'd love to hear about how you all started to do that. Please, Julie, let us let us know kind of how how the professional, um, how you shaped what, what John was doing in the research findings. Uh, I had started working with Vietnam vets, then people who had addictions. I worked in the ghetto of Boston, uh, working with heroin addicts. I worked with schizophrenics. I had worked with people who had very, very serious trauma, physical abuse, sexual abuse, torture, and so on. And that's what I specialized in during graduate school, again, my PhD. Then when I came into Seattle, my practice was, again, specializing in those areas, including folks who suffered from very serious personality disorders, too. So 
I've always loved to work with the most difficult folks, but they were individuals or I was treating groups. Then John and I would talk at dinner, much to our daughter's boredom, about my cases, his research, and I couldn't help but be fascinated by his findings. And about nine years into our marriage, we were sitting out in a canoe uh, in the Pacific Ocean, and we started to talk about our work, and I said, God, we've got to use this stuff to help people. It's crazy that it's sitting inside the ivory tower and not reaching people out there who are suffering so greatly, especially in relationship. So we began to create the theory of the Sound Relationship House. We created that together. Then in creating the interventions, um, we began to fight (laughs) tooth and nail um, because um, I was very cognizant of how people vary in their pacing of their work, how difficult it is for people to build trust in the therapy and especially in relationships which were distressed, build trust in each other. And there needed to be a great deal of flexibility in the model. And uh, John, coming from research, really saw the prescriptive value of reversing what created marital disasters and what needed to happen to help those couples resemble successful uh, relationships. However, given all of the comorbidities people carried into the office with them, treatment had to allow for those comorbidities and support people uh, through healing those, or at least working on those, while working on relationship dynamics. So, uh, after a couple of years, we ended our fighting. John realized in when he started working therapeutically with couples <laughs> that it wasn't as simple as it appeared uh, in the lab. So, uh, meanwhile, I became fascinated with the lab and the research methodology and so on. So uh, we began to create our workshops together using methods that not only changed behavior but dug deep into the hearts and the souls of the individuals composing those relationships so that people could learn much more about themselves and actualize themselves more deeply in witnessing each other in the couple therapy. So great things you all have been able to do is to distill down very complicated research methodology and findings and distill them not only to therapists but to the general public. So things that are just in the couple therapy lexicon now, the four horsemen, five to one ratio, a gridlock, softened startup, these these kind of proprietary Gottman concepts that all came really from the research. And then as you said, Julie, morphed into your workshops, then uh, that turned into you know your, your many great offerings for the general gen- Uh, general public. Talk about really of all of that, those findings and and the way you made them accessible to people. What do you think all these years later was some of the most influential findings from that that longitudinal research? I think probably John's hallmark book, uh, The Seven Principles for Making Marriage Work, was really the huge breakthrough working with Dan Goleman to make the language that of the general public as opposed to academia and creating the storytelling. John, I'm sure have seen, is a master storyteller, but he had differentiated between telling stories and the academic, more dry uh, production of his research results. So Dan really helped John to formulate those together, to unite the storytelling he's so wonderful and brilliant at doing, with the research behind the stories. And who doesn't want to hear a great story, right? So in that book, you really have the first presentation of the research delivered through stories, through metaphor, through more poetic language that people of all walks of life can embrace. Yeah, uh, who coined, I'm curious, who coined uh, Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse? Uh, I believe John, I think. Yeah. Did you, dear? I think you did. Yeah, right. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah I, I was inspired by the Book of Revelations, which you know I think is one of the most exciting uh, liturgical stories of the end of the world potentially. So, you know, here was really the same story, but spelled the end of intimate relationships. So it was kind of like these four horsemen, you know, and in the book of Revelations, it's pestilence, famine, war, and death. But uh, here were the fault lines of relationships, almost like the tectonic plates sliding <laughs> and creating these huge fault lines. And that was, that was the idea in coining that phrase. When did you all decide you talk about how you all collaborated when, because I imagine when you started, yes, it was about predicting the, the, what made the difference between the disasters and the masters, as you say. When did you realize, hey, this is, uh, our work as most systemic thinkers and couple therapists think could be geared towards strength and health and actually preserving relationships instead of talking about what causes relationships failure? Because that, that really seemed to shift in your trajectory and in your all's career. When, when did that? Well, you know, that really happened when we started studying the transition to parenthood in our apartment lab. Mm -hmm. And it was quite startling that two-thirds of the couples who had, had their baby in the first three years of the baby's life had this big precipitous drop in relationship happiness. And on the videotapes, huge increase in hostility between one another. And as they interacted with their babies, Edtronic, you know, taught me how to observe babies. He's the master at parent-infant interaction. And we could see the effect of this decrease in relationship happiness, increase in hostility on the baby directly. And the ability to predict from uh, the last trimester of pregnancy how a couple talked to one another about conflict predicted the nature of the baby's personality how much the baby would laugh and cry, whether the baby would be able to self-soothe, and all kinds of things about that infant. So that two-thirds drop, two-thirds of couples having this drop in relationship happiness was really spectacularly uh, dramatic, I think. And we could predict from the videotapes of couples when they, just a couple of months after the wedding, which couple would be in the two-thirds group that would really suffer with when they had their first baby, or the one third that didn't suffer, that where the relationship stayed happy. And so Julie and I designed this uh, preventative workshop called Bringing Baby Home. For almost 80% of couples in 10 hours was able to eliminate this drop in relationship happiness. That's our biggest effect size in all of our interventions. Um, and that's when we got really interested in the prevention aspect. Let me let me jump in here. Um, in addition, you know, John has not only studied what produces disasters, but he was also comparing what were the successful couples doing that led to the success and the longevity, healthy longevity of their relationship. So that when we began to work nine, ten years into our relationship, we also began to conceptualize together therapeutically what interventions could help a couple transition from the negative patterns they had been living into the successful patterns that we had observed in the lab for couples who were healthy and happy 20 years down the road. So we began to create the interventions together. There, you know, there came some of the fights, right? But at the same time, we were also very creative as a team together in thinking about how could a couple grasp the concepts of a healthy relationship, but at the same time learn themselves how to do it. What were they exactly doing, uh, those successful couples in the lab, to preserve the health of their relationship, and how could we give those practices, not just the information, but the practices to the couples who were struggling to convert their routine negative patterns into new uh, shoots of grass, basically, new healthy relationships that could grow over time. It was an incredibly intense creative process. 
that took the observations from the lab, backed those up in time to generate and foster new patterns of behavior as well as new bridges between the partners that could create more trust between them. Yeah, those must have been incredibly rich conversations between the two of you at the time. So I think of when you talk about those kind of prototype early Gottman interventions, Julie, are you talking about things like the dreams within conflict intervention and things like that? Yes, yes. Yeah, so we realized, Eli, that um, that any therapy we built really had to look at uh, interaction from various perspectives. So we knew that essentially everybody was right. So a psychodynamic point of view was right. Um, the early experiences of, of people in life as children really influenced things. Attachment theory was right. Uh, there was good data to support the importance of the early relationship, and we were studying early relationships in the lab as well. And we knew that from looking at conflict that also any therapy had to be uh, have an existential uh, philosophical basis as well. And we had to bring Viktor Frankl into the couple's arena. So we had to look at all these different ways of looking at relationships, not just one. Yes, and I also think... You know, not only did this research lay way, uh, give ground to these kind of empirically informed interventions that we're speaking of, but it also kind of set the field and corrected some of these myths that people have had about couple functioning and couples therapy, like anger is bad for, or anger always leads to divorce. Obviously, your work found like, no, anger, even in the best couples, is not predictive. It's, it's how you deal with it. And other things, what I really love too, the field was built on at this time, if you were getting trained in couples therapy 30 or 40 years ago, you were learning behavioral marital therapy, now known as traditional behavioral couple therapy of course Neil Jacobson's work uh, and the, and this idea of behavioral exchange and another thing I really find fascinating in your research it turned this idea of quid pro quo uh, scorekeeping tit for tat that in original models of therapy was thought as a good thing uh, but actually your re- re- research showed the opposite so can you talk about really how that uh, those findings really not only informed the, the Gottman model but also really corrected a lot of these assumptions we had as a field yeah, I mean, it, it seemed like such a good idea, this idea that you could create contracts. And, you know, and it was called give to get, you know, give in order to get. And Bernard Merstein was really the first person that, you know, labeled this thing E. He used the letter E as a way of talking about exchange. And this exchange orientation, you know, which in many uh, settings seems to make sense, like in a business setting. You know, that there would be this reciprocity of positive things that would guide people's behavior. In a love relationship, that idea of give to get was just a disaster. In fact, it was counterproductive. People didn't start thinking about what did I get and what did I give, becoming emotional accountants, essentially, until the relationship was bad. So it was a way of thinking about intimate relationships that was characteristic of ailing relationships, not good relationships. And the book, The Mirages of Marriage, written by Don Jackson and uh, William Lederer, you know, really suggested that that was really the sine qua non, you know, of good relationships. They were 180 degrees wrong, and they were very smart people. So, you know, we found that it really wasn't give to get. It was in relationships. It was just give, because that's what love's about. It's not conditional. Yeah, if, if you're all in, you're not worried about keeping score. You know that it will even out eventually sometime in, in the end. Uh, so I, I couldn't agree more. When you think about the the origin of the field in the 70s and 80s, when you began and in, in, in what it and where it is now, where, where do you think um, the biggest changes in the profession of couple therapy uh, in the field of couple therapy have been since you started and now? You know, I think the biggest changes really have come from the therapy becoming research-based as opposed to conjecture and speculation. Early therapy, Bowenian therapy and so on, was based on the triune brain, Uh, the idea of a triune brain, which has been thrown out the window. As you mentioned yourself, Eli, uh, that 
contractual behavioral therapy, quid pro quo therapy, and so on, got thrown out because research, again, proved that it was dead on wrong. So what we've become is much more careful in terms of trying to represent reality in our therapy. (laughs) And research has been our guide in like a compass in terms of where we begin in therapy, what's distressing for a couple, and where we need to go, what is successful for a couple. So in changing the field, I think the research has really, of lots of people, uh, not just Gottman research, but lots of research out there, has been fantastic at really giving us guideposts for what the therapy needs to aim for. You see, the goals were wrong in that early therapy. Um, Trying to be, for example, less uh, emotion-based and much more, quote-unquote, rational. Well, now we know that the brain is a very integrated instrument, and we cannot make decisions without being informed by our emotions and our intuition in turn. So uh, emotion-based work that, of course, Susan Johnson has done a tremendous amount to advance has really helped inform the field. Lots of research out there has pointed us in the right directions. Yeah, I agree. I agree with Julie. Um, you know, this idea that there are gurus out there who know about relationships, and uh, you know that that sort of period has ended because nobody could really learn how to be a guru like Salvador Mnuchin, some of these some of these giants in family therapy, and so now with Susan Johnson's work and our work and Andy Christensen's research, people are really looking for specific things that they can do in therapy that make a difference to couples. And that focus on emotion, I think, is the huge one. And, you know, as Julie mentioned, Sue Johnson deserves enormous credit for changing the focus from from cognitive behavioral therapy to really an an emotionally-based therapy. Attachment theory has made a big contribution there in understanding um, the importance of emotion and secure bonding. But I think that you know, we've now moved even beyond attachment theory because it has limitations in understanding relationships. It's always back to the drawing board because uh, I know in my predictions, I've been wrong 60% of the time. So, you know, it's only data that inform us about what's true about relationships. When you just said that, you triggered me to think about another finding that I've always wanted to ask you about. I think you said something like uh, 30 31% 31% of all couple conflict is is solvable. And the er- origins of the field, like we said, problem-solving therapy, behavior exchange, and problem-solving. Well, what happens if you have one of these gridlock perpetual issues, if you call it? So your, your, your statistic, right, it was like 69% of all couple issues are perpetual. It's kind of in the soup and you can't get it out. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's right, Eli. That is a wonderful finding for those of us who most of us, in fact, who have perpetual problems in our own relationships, it's absolutely the norm. And we only found that out by following couples for as long as 20 years, bringing them back into the lab every year or two or maybe three, and finding that in the conflict conversations, they would have exactly the same topics that they would discuss, the same issues on either side. And the only thing that changed Uh, were their hairstyles and fashion. So, you know, uh, these problems don't go away. The thing that is most important is the type of dialogue that you have about the problem. And that's where the Dream Within Conflict intervention became central to converting gridlock conflict into healthy dialogue over the years. For example, um, John and I have classic perpetual problem lots of couples have, which is um, our lifestyle preference. John is comfortable with things being a little less tidy, and, you know, I'm comfortably OCD. I love things being very tidy. So, you know, there you have 
a classic perpetual problem of books and papers everywhere and Julie saying, okay, John, it's been four weeks. It's time to clean up. So we have to do that every few weeks and Mm -hmm. not get gridlocked into escalated quarrels that work on hurting the other person instead of living with differences in our lifestyle preference. Well, the other thing, Eli, is that it, it, this, this idea of dreams within conflict really depathologizes relationships because, you know, rather than saying this person is narcissistic or borderline or too emotional or autistic, not emotional enough, you know, really there are good reasons why people don't compromise on these gridlock conflicts. It's because compromise feels like selling out something that is core to yourself. This is where the existential part of conflict is very important. Not all relationship conflicts are the same. And on these perpetual conflicts, quite often, you know, when couples get to talk about the meaning of their position, they really gain a lot of insight into one another, a lot of uh, empathy and understanding, and they can reach an accommodation on, on these issues. Not that they go away, but they can really understand one another better. Yeah, I think for me in my work as a couples therapist and a trainer of couples therapists, that that finding and that idea that there's just some issues that are always going to be there. So stop banging your head together trying to solve a problem that's unsolvable has been transformative in working on acceptance and tolerance skills and how how to find a dream under the conflict. What makes you all effective? Uh, if anybody's ever gone to a Gottman training, seen John and Julie, they very, I mean, they are real in the sense that they talk about their marriage. So I am curious, you know, that good therapy is both art and science. And we've talked about the science that it, that the Gottman model is grounded in, but as far as your own relationship and uh, the ebb and flow of a 30 plus year marriage, tell us about how your own marriage has informed your thinking and your model. The Dream Within Conflict intervention, for example, um, came out of a gridlock conflict that we had, that we had been working on for probably five or six years, something like that. And we still couldn't find a, a path forward. And one day, one night, actually, at the end of work, uh, we were still thinking about the problem. And the problem was we had a big difference of opinion in terms of having a little cabin on Orcas Island in addition to our home in Seattle. Really wanted the cabin. John did not. And when we began to ask each other questions, because certainly we knew that uh, there were deeper roots, listen to what came out. This was just just so stunning to us. When John talked about not wanting any place on Orcas Island, we could always just rent a place. When he looked at question of history, well, his history was that his parents were Holocaust survivors who ended up in the Dominican Republic. They survived, barely, uh, and uh, had a heck of a time doing so. Lost everything, of course, that they had built in Vienna, their livelihood. And so when they came to the Dominican Republic in 1942 and later in the United States, uh, 45, they had enough. And the message there from the history is don't accumulate things because you never know when you're going to have to leave to escape for your lives. That was the history of him. So my history was totally different. Growing up uh, as a third generation American, my grandparents had immigrated from Russia. But by the time I came along in 1951, things were settled. But the home was very dysfunctional that I grew up in. But I had the good fortune of growing up in Oregon, two blocks away from a beautiful wild forest where I would escape at night and I would sleep there overnight. And I had my favorite tree to sleep in, actually, and I slept there many, many nights beginning at age eight. So I essentially had a home in the wilderness that was safety and gave my life peace. So look at the differences there in the history. One, a refugee, John himself was a refugee to America, speaking of immigration. It was not 
uh, a lesson there to accumulate anything. You do not accumulate. Mine was have a home in the wilderness. There's your safety. So when it came to discussing do we get a cabin or not on Orcas Island, you can see the sources of the pain, the conflict, the history, and the deeper meaning, the existential meanings below that history that we had to unearth in order to build compassion for one another. And long story short, we decided to get a cabin in a compromise solution where I agreed to be kosher for 11 years if we got a cabin. <laughs> <laughs> so we got a cabin. We stopped being kosher after about eight years because it was too difficult. In Seattle. And John fell in love with Orcas Island where we now live in a house full time. Right. There's the end of the, a happy end of the story. Yeah, but, you know. Yep. Yeah, and you know, and, and and one of the things that's so interesting about that was that that led us to go back to the lab and re-examine 935 gridlock conflicts, and in every case we could identify a a dream, a hope, a wish behind each person's position. So we were able to see that. 69% of you know, those gridlock conflicts, um, people weren't compromising because they were speaking on the surface of the issue and weren't getting down to the existential part of why they had such strong views on this particular issue. And that led to the dreams within conflict intervention. So the stuff that happened in our marriage was really a way of then us going back and re-examining the data. That's the important thing. And, and generating the intervention by slowing down couples' conversations about a gridlocked issue with the listener asking questions that unearth dreams, unearth history, uh, existential ideas of importance that mm -hmm. were embedded in each person's mm -hmm. position on the issue. That right. had to come out in order for people to learn how to really listen to one another at a deeper level, build compassion for each other that could then soften the edges of the conflict and enable them to build compromises. And then, yeah, is, it. The, then, then we tested it, and we tested it, Eli. That's the important thing, is yeah. that we found that 87% of the time, the dreams within conflict really does lead to temporary compromises that work. So we had to go back, not only devise the intervention, but then test it. Right. Yeah, it's a beautiful story tying how this all together, and I very I appreciate you sharing that very personal uh, account of both of your family of origin experiences that uh, led to this softening uh, from each one of you. I like that you said that that wasn't just a one-time conversation. I think you said, Julie, that took about several years of you all going back and forth to develop that really shared dream underneath that. So it is nice to hear that even the, the experts, this is not something that you do once. It is an ongoing dialogue. I think we just fought about it on the surface for six years, and then one night we had a major breakthrough. And that led to all the history and then the intervention itself. Yeah, and we're hardly marriage experts. The one thing that is really important here is that I needed to really understand the depth of Julie's intuitions when it came to therapy and really learn from her based upon all the work she'd done with very traumatized people. And she also needed to accept influence from me about measurement because we designed this sound relationship house theory so that it could be proven wrong, so that we could measure every single idea in, in that theory in the laboratory and actually be able to precisely know what we were talking about. And as we developed this theory over a 25-year period, it was wrong a lot of the time, and we could fix it because we could measure stuff. And also, I needed to understand, you know, really that Julie, Julie had insight that I didn't have about how to work with very, very difficult couples and how to work with trauma. So I think that going back and forth between, you know, our two sources of strength was what led us to this 
work that I think is very broad in its approach. It's very eclectic. Yeah, I think one of the things that I think we have brought to the field, and especially John, is the importance of also believing in science, believing that research really does unpack the truth about what's going on in relationships as well as what's going on in individuals. And we know that one of the things that has been a major mistake in the field is not understanding how sometimes individuals who compose those relationships are very troubled individuals, part of what John is saying. And in fact, we have gathered data on something like 63,000 couples who are entering couple therapy through our relationship checkup. The thing that we have found is stunning that a huge percentage of couples suffer from addiction. A huge percentage suffer from trauma. Many, many are depressed. People ha have many more comorbidities than we ever dreamed of. And this data has been gathered over the last three years or so. Now, I don't know whether in the history of our field, people were not as troubled and distressed and sick as they are now. I don't know. Uh, we don't have the research that we have now. But what we are seeing is that we cannot base our studies of couple therapy on our usual little university student or uh, graduate student population of couples. We have got to go out into the world to democratize our research, to really see real people on the streets, what they suffer from, what they are going through, and how that informs their relationship and continue to refine the research as well as the therapy to support and accommodate those terrible stresses that couples are enduring today that feeds into the unhealth of their relationships and help them cope with those stresses, cope with the internal turmoil that many of them live with every day. So well said, and, and you're correct. You were speaking earlier about the, the field was based on these really charismatic individuals and had these almost cult-like followings. Uh, and at the time, MFT specifically was slow to get on the bandwagon with research. As long as you could put on a live dazzling demo, it, it didn't matter if you had empirical proof. But we know now that, again, what we do is an art and science, and you can't think of what the work you all have done without thinking of the science uh, grounds you. And like you said, John, you set up your sound marital house theory, the two of you willing uh, to, to let it, uh, to, to let the data show the truth. And you revised your theory based on what your findings said. So I think it is a, a beautiful way of looking at the, the integrative nature of what we do of couple therapy is both an art and a science and really thinking that therapy, these kind of universal principles uh, applied to couples, but also needing to study couples uh, as we see them today. And those aren't the couples studied in an ivory tower in a very controlled setting. Therapists want to know what's going to uh, what's gonna work for my crisis clients that are coming in the room tonight, not what works for just a select a few amount of people. And I think what made it the Gottman Method so so long lasting is your ability to use research to keep refining it and speaking refining it and what's next in february uh 2019 eight dates was released which i um, would love to hear about that and then just in general you will have accomplished so much but uh whenever i do these interviews the common factor talking to model developers it doesn't matter how chronologically old they are, how long they've been in the field, their passion is there. So I would guess you still have more that both of you would like to accomplish. So tell us about Eight Dates and then what lays ahead. Yeah, I, well, Eight Dates was a lot of fun. Uh, we did it with a, a couple who are dear friends of ours. Uh, and uh, Doug Abrams and Dr. Rachel Carton Abrams collaborated with us. And we, we wanted to do something that was a gift to couples that they could do on their own without a therapist and really make a difference. 
dating was an area where, you know, there have been a lot of TV shows of how people do, go on first dates and how they partner with one another. And, you know, what you see on YouTube are these disastrous first dates where people, you know, drink in order to relax and, you know, really make bad choices and have disastrous dates. So we did a study with uh, 300 couples, gay, lesbian, and heterosexual couples, who agreed to uh, tape record their dates and join us in, in fine-tuning the dates so that we could create questions that people could ask on the dates so that they could remain curious with, with one another about how they're changing and growing. We expected this originally to be just interesting to couples who were new to one another, but it turned out that something like uh, 57% of the couples in our sample were couples who'd been in relationships, all knew each other, uh, had lived together for quite some time, maybe even had children together, and, uh, and they really benefited from the dates because as the Sloan Center at UCLA found, in most uh, young relationships, people get so busy with children and career that their life degenerates to this infinitely long to-do list. And that's what they interact about. They don't really keep romance alive. They don't keep curiosity and one another alive. So the Eight Dates book was an attempt to do that, to change relationships. So people were really focusing on the relationship and keeping it alive and romantic and especially curious. Yeah, wonderful. And when you think about what's what you have left to accomplish collectively in the field of couple therapy, uh, what, what does that look like for the two of you all? I'll tell you something in very, very general terms that we are working on today. We have been talking a lot about therapy, but we haven't really mentioned assessment. And one of the things that John and I have done with several close friends of ours is start a little company on the side that is linked to the Gottman Institute. And we are basically making the love lab and enabling clinicians to give a full love lab assessment, just like we would do in the lab itself, in their own offices using the current technology and brand new algorithms that are available, supplied by our fabulous friends, in order to empower clinicians to sit down with a couple for the first time, bring them into their to their offices from the waiting room, and using either iPads or even phones, be able to uh, do a full-on couple therapy assessment by basically pushing a few buttons and giving a bit of instruction to the couple. Coming back with a full uh, report for the clinicians about the strengths and the challenges that faces their physiology, what's going on inside their bodies as well as between them, as well as creating a report that the clinician can then give couple as well in order to shape how the therapist and the couple will move forward in the interventions. What are the challenges that couple faces in particular uniquely in their relationship that the clinician needs to work. That's what we're working on now. This is a question I asked everybody, and sometimes it's, it's difficult, especially if you have to, in a bubble of your own career, in this case, careers and relationship, is the legacy question. When you think of all the things we've talked about this hour and all that you've accomplished, how do you want to be remembered, John and Julie, in the field of couple therapy? Oh, gosh, I've never even thought of that. Um, you know, I, I think what I hope for is that, first of all, we are not so much remembered individually as the methods themselves, uh, which become integrated into the vocabulary of a therapist working with couples in the future, uh, like the word Velcro, the interventions themselves help clinicians to really reach out to couples and be effective themselves in helping uh, those people 
coming into their own offices. That's one thing. And the other thing I really hope for is that by all the work of not only John and I, but the other scientists out there who are doing fabulous research, that we continue to refine the methods, change the methods, alter them, add new ones through research rather than opinions, TV shows, magazine articles, through research to define what is really going to help people. Truth comes from research and that every therapy that we do has to be embedded in the reality of what couples are really experiencing and what they need. Yeah, what I would say, Eli, what, yeah, that was well said. What I, what I would love to leave as a legacy is the journal Science in the year uh, 2000 identified the major challenges facing our species. And one of them was really the challenge of cooperation. And I think, you know, we see that our species is capable of great empathy and altruism and, and love, also capable of great competition, aggression, and war. We are a contradiction. You know, we're both capable of cooperation and competition. We're capable of, of really hurting one another as well. I would love to change relationships so that we create the conditions that facilitate cooperation in our species. We need to learn what those conditions are that create unity. I think we're headed toward the idea that we are one tribe globally. As people travel, as people intermarry and have children of all different mixed races and ethnicities, I think we will become the global tribe. And I hope we'll become the global tribe that learns how to cooperate rather than compete and hurt one another. And so the legacy I would like to leave is that we learn how to facilitate cooperation in love relationships and families first. And I think we can, uh, can accomplish that. I can't thank you enough, both of you, for your time. This has been a wonderful hour, and I hope our, our listeners have learned, you know, if they knew about the Gottman or the Gottman Method before, they've gotten to see the, the people behind the model. And I can't thank you enough, Julie and John, for sharing your time and your story with us here at the AMFT Podcast. Thank you, Eli. Eli, it's been wonderful. Thank you also to you for creating this podcast, yes. for reaching out to you know, the wonderful group of therapists out there who are doing their best to help people and bringing people who <laughs> love to talk onto your podcast. So thank you so very much for the opportunity. Eli, back with you, bringing to a close another pioneer series two pioneers for the price of one today john and julie gottman and truly the whole is greater than the sum of their parts as we say in systemic language and i really love you know john gottman has got a lot of credit over the years but he's the first one to say there is no clinical application of his great research without his collaboration with his wife julie and i think you could see today how they work together both as an art and science, which I think of as a field, that's what we do. Great representatives of our field of couple therapy, John and Julie Gottman. If you haven't been to Gottman.com, that's the place to go. And there you will see everything that the Gottman Institute has to offer. Their research-based approach to relationships. Right now, there are multiple training opportunities. Gottmans, of course, have a certification program, which includes three levels. And there's more trainings involving the seven principles for making marriage work, the psychoeducational curriculum, bringing home baby, and there's the special interest areas, treating affairs and trauma, and couples and addiction recovery. The Gottman Institute, they have something for everybody. And we'd like to think we at the AMFT podcast here have something for everybody. What are we doing these Pioneer Series interviews? my favorite part of the program over the last two years. There's the Gottmans, there's people like Sue Johnson, Bill Doherty, Chloe Madonis, too many to name and more coming up in future installments. And then we have our deep dives into really important topics of who mix 
both, and we rely on you, the listener, to give us feedback. Please, I love corresponding with you. Drop me an email. It's info at elikaram.com. E-L-I-K-A-R-A-M.com. Follow us on Twitter. My handle is doctor at Dr. Eli Live. The AMFTs is at the AMFT. Until next time, my friends, stay systemic.